Welcome back to IGCC ICT paper 0417. We will be doing paper 1, which is a theory paper. Variant 1, 2 for May, June 2023. This paper should take up to 1 hour and 30 minutes in your actual exam when you're answering it. And the instruction states that all the questions are compulsory. You should use a dark or a blue pen. Uh, pencils are not allowed unless if you're going to use it for diagrams or graphs or any rough work at the back or the corners, you can use it with a pencil. You have to write your name, center number, and candidate number in those boxes as mentioned at the top here. You have to write your answer in their specified places, wherever it is mentioned. We will sh I will show you this in a while. Do not use erasable pen or correction fluid. And do not write any of those on any of those barcodes that you can see at the corner or the bottom or any of the signs. Total score is going to be 80 and the number of each question will be mentioned in brackets down here. And no marks will be awarded using brand names or software packages. So you need to be clear about this point that you're not allowed to use any brand names. Whenever you're going to refer to any hardware or software, you better use its general name, not the specific company's name. So let's start with the first question. A book contains a barcode whose number is this following number. Tick uh, the most appropriate validation check to test the validity of the barcode. So usually with the barcode, we have one type of validation, which is called a check digit. And it is the most appropriate to be used. Actually, it is already used with it together. So you won't find any of this commonly, but this is the most common or most usable in this. As you can see in this barcode, you can see in this barcode, you have one, like a number. And each part of the number is denoting to something like country code, manufacturer, uh, center bars, product code. And the, usually the last digit is referring to the check digit. So it is a type of validation used with those barcodes. Question number two. Identify the most appropriate hardware from the description given. All right, here you need to be careful about the keywords. Whenever you're reading, you need to mention that hardware. So as we mentioned that in hardware, we have internal hardwares and some external. Let me show you that. As you can see here in this diagram, we have for the hardware two categories, internal and external. Internal is whatever usually is inside the device. And it usually will contain ROM, RAM, CPU, motherboard, and etc. For the external parts, it's usually visible with your eyes. You can see it directly every day in your life while you're using it. Like mouse, keyboard, screen, uh, touch pen, or, and those type of stuff. They're usually considered external and they have their own categories. So most of the common internal devices is RAM and ROM as well. Uh, there are some differences between these two primary memories. The RAM is usually temporary while ROM is permanent. So if you found something denoting a keyword as permanent, you should know that they're speaking about RAM. If it is temporary, then you should know it's speaking about RAM. Oh, you can say it in other words is volatile or temporary while ROM is permanent or non-volatile means it's not changing its uh, content. That's why, because it's not changing its content, so it can be only read. So that's why it, from its own name, read-only memory, so it can only read its own data from it. You cannot alter it, you cannot change whatever inside this chip. While this can be written and read from as well in RAM. And RAM, as we say that it is part of the operating system that whatever we're using currently, and you can see that in the task manager, and can be increased in size to improve your overall task whenever you're working on your computer. Uh, for right now, this is the important point for the ROM right now, back again to it. So we said it's permanent and volatile, read only, only memory, so it cannot be altered its content. And the most important thing that it can store the BIOS. And the BIOS, it means basic input output uh, system. Uh, so most of those things that whatever you needed to starting up to your computer, uh, like connecting the keyboard, mouse, all those type of stuff is usually stored inside ROM. Whenever you're booting your computer, starting up your computer, it usually go and check all those input output devices 
are they connected? This is usually used to be very prominent in the old devices. Whenever a keyboard or a mouse is not connected, it's going to come in a on a black screen or blue screen, telling you that some device is not connected. So you need to make sure of the connection of the cable. And then after that, you need to restart the computer to make sure that the ROM or BIOS is able to detect everything is connected. So this is usually uh, about the ROM. So you can see here from the question, let me get back again to the question, non-volatile, non-volatile, it's internal memory, and it is usually used for the startup instructions. So all those keywords relating to the ROM. Another one is an internal component that provides both input and output. Here is an important thing. It provides both input and output for the audio signal. If they mention only one, whether they mention input, for the audio signal, then at that time you have to refer as a mic. If then mention output for the audio signal, that that means speaker or any other output devices. So in this case, they're saying it's an internal device. That's one keyword. They're saying input and output. And the third keyword is the audio or audio signal. So it's clear that it's a sound card. C, an internal component that is composed of the main memory. So here is a main memory. So let me show you that it is an internal device. It is a main memory. So we have CPU, RAM, and ROM. They are considered main memories. And it consists of, all right, this making it very clear, control unit and arithmetic logic unit. This is the architecture of the CPU. Let me show you this picture. If you notice this picture, which is the architecture of the CPU, CPU usually is always in the center. It is connected between input device and output device. It is what it got processed in between. And then inside the CPU, you're going usually to find two main units, the control unit and the arithmetic and logic unit. For more details, you should be able to read your book or we can uh, check it from the book here. By looking over here, you can see that the CPU is making a, made up of mainly control unit, which is controlling all the major input and output devices, whatever is coming inputting from here and coming out from the output device. So in the center, there is a CPU. And mainly you can see the control unit is what controlling most of it. And then you have the arithmetic and logic or ALU unit, which carrying out all the calculations and all the logical decisions that happening is over here. And then you have a, a third part, which is called the registers, which is a very small memory. And you're going to find it as part of the CPU. So mainly you have two of those units. And again, back to this question. So all those keywords noting to the CPU, or you can write it down as a full word or just a process. Question number three. A head teacher is producing a web page about history of her school. She has been given some old hard copy photographs, all right, which she will include on the web page. All right, so she's trying to make a web page and she got some hard copy photographs for that school. Okay. She has a digital camera. That's one device. We're going to use it right now and a scanner. So she has two devices to use to convert the hard copies photographs into a digital format. So we want to get a digital format. So the question is compare. Compare the use of digital camera with a scanner in this scenario. Your answer must include similarities and differences. All right, there is something called command word. Command word, which what it explains to you uh, in, Cambridge, uh, exam, in Cambridge exams, what are those questions or what are those commands and how to use them? So let me open those command words for you. These gold command words, you're going to find it in the description. I put the file and you can download it from the description part. The command words, this can apply to all the subjects of Cambridge. You can find most of the questions over here. So let's say right now we're going to answer about compare. Mostly, remember in compare question, you need to compare or identify the similarities between those two devices so what are the common features and similarities between two devices and what are the differences okay so in comparison usually both of them you have to mention it if uh, they ask you only the similarities if they mention it so that's fine you can just give the similarities or you can just give the differences I'm going to show you this one this question for example if you got a question that is called contrast right now in our case question is compared so let's say the question is contrast in case it is a contrast question and they didn't explain to you how to answer it then remember you have to give only the differences 
no need for the similarities. But in compare case, you can give both similarities and differences or just one of them. Unless if the question instructed you clearly how to answer it. Here it is clearly mentioned. We have to give both similarities and differences. Second thing you have to also be careful whenever you're going to answer the theory paper <clears throat> is the points. How many points we have to for this question. In this question we have four points. That means logically that you can have two similarities and two points for differences. So I'm here in my question I'm giving up to more than four points and you can reduce it you can just write up to four points. So second thing or third thing you need to notice that whenever you're going to answer this type of questions remember all right in this question it's given like this like lines and you have to enter over those lines so whenever you have this type of lines remember don't write it in bullet points like first this is the first comparison this is second comparison this is a third similarity and fourth similarity you know write it down in this paragraph format okay Ignoring the first line over here, start from here. So there are similarities such as, right now I'm going just to tell you roughly that both they can capture images and then explain a bit more. So both digital camera and scanner have the ability of capturing or clicking or taking pictures. They convert from the phys those physical images into a digital format. So second point, both can store digital data as well. So both have the ability or they have memory to store this data. And both create digital images as well after scanning or taking those pictures. So those are around three or four differences. You can mention any of the two of them. The difference is you can say that both digital camera is more portable while scanner is usually fixed in the place and it's not easy to carry. Okay, so that's one of the comparisons. Another scanner can capture the images in more depth and detail as it is clear, stable, you have to put it in the place, close the scanner and take the picture so it can give you high resolution and better quality of the pictures. While the digital camera do not capture, you know, with this high resolution, okay? Second point, scanners do not have a keystone effect. Keystone effect, let me show you what is the keystone effect. Keystone effect is whenever you're going to take pictures with the camera, you usually have some lighting in some of the places, shadow, or it's not completely identical from all the sides. So it's going to be a little bit having short proportions from some of the sides. So it's not that much equal from all the four sides. While this, uh, the scanner do not have this keystone effect, so it is usually very clear, not any glare or shadow in it. Next point also you can say that it can, uh, uh, the same thing about digital camera, it can have uh, that glare or shadow of the image explaining about the keystone. And next point is the digital camera has a faster data capture rate because it is usually fast, just keep clicking. The next difference is the digital camera has a faster uh, data capture as it is in your hand portable so you can easily keep clicking. Scanner can take a bit of time as it will scan throughout the whole paper or picture. So those are the main differences for this question. Next question is the uh, company is using an extra net. So it's about the uh, chapter, I think from the end, uh, last ending chapters in the book. So it's about extra net. So explain what is meant by extra net. So we have three terms over here, internet, intranet, and extra net. So they want you to explain what is meant by extra net. So internet is a global connection or network. Inter intranet is a specific or private connection which is used for a specific company. So you can say that intranet is a specifically for a specific company, okay? While extranet is you're trying to connect to that intranet from out resources, from outside place. So an extranet is part also of that company's intranet, okay? Another point you can say also that uh, extranet is it's a company giving a permission to for some customer or specific people to access that intranet so it become an extranet. You can also mention that it's enabling some of the business people to exchange some of the information in a very secure way. If you compare it between intranet and intranet slash uh, extranet, you will find that intranet slash extranets are is very secure comparing to the intranet. Intranet is a bit risky as it is a global network, more hackers, more prone to the global and public so 
everyone can probably access your data, unlike intranet and extranet. So it's enabling to exchange the data in more secure way. Uh, another point is also it requires credential or usernames to log into it. So it's not just anyone have access and can just go and, log and access it. No, it needs some credentials and company usually will give you those credentials to access it. Okay, uh, before answering this question, again, I answered without caring. So we need to care about the command words, explain, and how many points. From overall here, you have just to choose two points and write them in a continuous way, not like line by line. Two points and make it continuously, making sense, like connected sentences. And again, explain. If you checked over here, explain. Explain it is setting out purpose or reasons to make a relationship between things, make it in a clear way. So you have to support it with some relevant evidence. So what they mean that here you have to give an answer with within with two points and make those two points connected. For example, an extranet is a part of the company's intranet given from a company, okay? And the company gives the permission for the customer and suppliers to access it. So two connected sentences. So we're still about extranet speaking. The next part is B. Describe the difference between intranet and extranet. So first let's look at the command word which is describe and how many points we have to. So again, describe is going. What we need to do in describe is just like we have been always using describe word. So it's like stating just uh, the main points with a specific of that specific topic. And we have to give the characteristics and the main features, whatever they're asking about it, which is to describe the differences between intranet and extranet. And in this question as well, don't give it point by point. You just need to make it as one uh, complete paragraph. And we have to give minimum at least or just two points. Okay, uh, the question is about intranet and extranet. So let me first explain to you the full words of each. Intranet is usually connected, uh, coming from the word. Uh, interconnected network while intranet is from internal restricted access network and the last one which is extranet which is uh, external restricted access network intranet as I mentioned it's a global uh, public network while intranet is a company's specific internal internal network with their own employees or staff using it only available in that specific location so extranet it's like, again, for that same internal subscribers and users people, but available in from a different location. Like, let's say from another country, you want to uh, connect to that intranet. It's possible, but it become at that time an extranet. So we need to compare right now between the extranet and the intranet. So you can mention that the intranet allows the public access of information, whereas extranet allowed limited access, okay? You can also mention that extranet is more secure while intranet is uh, more public so it's prone to the security of the information and the intranet is not owned by any specific people or group whereas the extranet is owned by a specific company so more information can be related with that company or can be available about that specific company okay uh, another thing is more information can be available on intranet globally worldwide so if you want specific information about like more information about different topics you're going definitely to find it on intranet while extranet will be rare about general or in generally about more of the information it won't be available on extranet but it will be more available on intranet for the next question question number five State which health issue is more likely to occur from each description shown. Your answer must be different in each case. Okay. Uh, typing on a keyboard for long periods of time. So what issue can happen? Health issue. I'm trying to right now get the health issue. So what health issue can happen when you're trying to type on a keyboard for a long period? Here we're having multiple issues that can happen to us. Most of them is, most common is the RSI, which is repetitive strain injury that can happen on your uh, wrist, especially. Or there is another one that can be called carpal tunnel syndrome or, or carpal syndrome. Let me show you those in details. As you can see here, RSIs, or usually sometimes it's known as ULDs, which is upper limb disorder, 
this usually can happen because of excessive using or gaming you can say on keyboard or mouse using them for very long periods uh, we have some of the solutions for them of course and then we have another one which is the carpal tunnel syndrome carpal tunnel syndrome usually happens uh, in the wrist over here and it causes some of the swelling burning not comfortable feeling over here and it can cause also some numbness tangling and pain of course in this area and that of course happened because of the same purpose that I mentioned previously cubital is a different one it usually happens in the elbow area and it causes also quite similar uh, symptoms in that area Okay, the next one, looking at computer screen for a long period, that definitely will hurt your eye. So it's an eye strain and it can also lead to the headache and neck ache. So for those type of issues as well, back ache and neck problems that can happen because of it. So you need to adjust your posture, have a regular or adjusting chair and tilt your computer in a proper way that is facing you properly and use a foot rest. Okay, anyway, for the next question, C, sitting with poor posture. Sitting with a poor posture also, it can cause you the back pain and back ache uh, and the neck ache. As you can see here, back and neck issue or can happen because of not sitting properly and because of also the chair quality is not good that can give you the back pain. and uh, So you can avoid it by using adjustable chair, sitting in a good posture, using a foot rest and using a tilted screen all right so those are like one points for each answer you can just use any of those answers no need to be double or triple answers question number six a company requires its employees to regularly change their login passwords for the company's computer system so there is a company asking their employees always keep to changing their passwords passwords for their company's computer systems okay so the password must be strong and cannot be reused again. If you used it once, you cannot reuse it again. Explain three problems that may occur when employees change their password regularly. Of course, we're going to forget it mostly. So, okay, you have to explain it. So it needs to be further details in uh, according to the command words. It needs to be a bit in detail or is to explain. It needs to be with reasons and make a relationship between the sentences that you're mentioning. You can say also how or why to support those evidences. Okay, it needs to be a bit in depth and it needs to be detailed answer. Okay, so uh, one thing I want you to see is here it has six points, so you can give up to th uh, three points. Will be like one 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 for three points. Okay, and then for the details you will get an extra three points. And I want you to see the way they hear writing it. So this is in bulletin points. So that's okay. You can write down the first sentence as I mentioned it here. So as, I, as you can see, as I wrote it here, the first point, second point with the details, third point with the details and so on. So let's see the first point. Let's point, uh, the first point, the password could become similar and security password could be weakened. So it can be same from time to time. That's why sometimes the security can be reduced if employees need to change it from time to time. So it might, they might need to memorize it in an easy way, which will lead them to use the same passwords, which will make it more weak over time uh, because they will use that specific pattern. Okay, next point, you can say also maybe more difficult to find different passwords as like for your regular passwords that you have been using. It can be sometimes difficult to create new passwords unless if you're using some software to create those passwords, strong passwords for you and saving it for you as well. But here the question is different and they're asking you, you need to create them and you need to memorize them by yourself. So, so, so if the password, uh, more difficult to create different passwords, so that's why the security can be weakened overall over time. The third point is, uh, Users can find it easily to forget this current password le leading to some lockout. As you're creating a new password, you might forget what you created yesterday and your system will be locked out. So you won't be able to log into that. So that can be re resulted because of forgetting that new password. 
there will be also many points that you can right now according to the points i answer this question so six points three points and with details so six points uh, you can also mention some can be typed incorrectly so you might forget and you won't be able to log in so there will be a login error that appearing another thing also the writing the password down so you won't forget it which will lead others to see and get your password those are different points that you can write them down and explain about them b still related with the same point about the company's password question here says the company has a website which uses a digital certificate explain the purpose of a digital certif of a digital certificate so a digital certificate as we learned in those previous chapters that digital certificates usually come within a password uh, within um, a website or an email or some different places so here I have only one point and it is just an explained question so it needs to be a bit in detail so I can make sure that it is uh, digital certificates to ensure the website is trusted or genuine website source and I think you can say also it verifies if the company owns that real website that website or no and it is to share the public key uh, you can see that inside the digital certificate let me open it we have a couple of things that can make sure that your website or email is genuine and one of them is the public key which is very important for the encryption as you can see here that in digital certificate we usually store the organization's name when it was issued and the email address and the user's country and the most important is the public key of that uh, user all right for C, a digital certificate is attached to an email. State three items contained in a digital certificate. Actually, this is mentioned clearly, like in your book. So here is the question, command word is state, and you have three points. And you can see the question is just given in bullet points. You just can mention the points like I mentioned here. So the same points actually is mentioned in your book as well. So company's owner name, the company's public key, the date issue, the expiry date, the digital signature and issue sender name as well and the serial number all those points are usually mentioned inside the digital certificate i just mentioned a few of the points but it contain actually more than those points okay for this question it is a practical question in the form of theory so a student question number seven a student is creating a spreadsheet that includes a formula to check a number entered in a cell is between two values okay so we're using a spreadsheet and we're going to include a formula to check a number entered in a cell between two values. The number is entered in cell A10 is an integer, okay? If the number is between the two values, then the message should be okay, is displayed. Otherwise, there should be another message, which is error message, is displayed if it is out of between those two numbers. The formula uh, the student has created is if, so we have an if function with multiple uh, uh, criteria so the first criteria is a10 so it is correct a10 supposed to be larger than one okay and a10 supposed to be less than 32 so it is between 1 and 32 the numbers will be allowed 2 and 31 so between these two numbers it's good so other so if it is between this range display okay otherwise display an error so data will be used to test the formula so identify two items so extreme data to students should be given the reason why this data will point. So extreme test data. So one of the extremes data is going to be two because that's the first number that will be allowed. One is not allowed because it should be more than one. So the first number is allowed is two as it is the minimum extreme. Second number is going to be allowed is 32, sorry, which is going to be 31 because it is allowed up to 32. So less than 32 is allowed. So the first number to be entered is 31 as the maximum extreme number. So we have those two. Don't make the mistake by entering these two numbers. That's a tricky question. And why is the reason? That's because the test boundaries, uh, that's, those are the test boundaries or extreme boundaries of that formula. And you can say to test the comparisons, which are correct. You can just test it and you will find out these are two extreme numbers. In B, student has entered an item of abnormal test data. 
explain why abnormal test data is used. All right, let me just show you the three types of test data or four types. Usually in testing, we have four types or mainly three types of testing data. One is called live data, which is the real uh, testing data and real actual outcomes should be expected from it. And then you have those three types of test data, which is normal, extreme, and abnormal. In normal, it is usually going to be between the range. Those are the uh, numbers. Let's say the range is from 1 till 12. So those are all normal data. Extreme, those are the edges, the maximum and the minimum. They're going to be the uh, numbers that allowed to be entered. Yeah? Abnormal is going to be out of this range, like 0, minus 1, even something written in words. This is abnormal. Okay. Even decimal, if it is because it is mentioned that it's a whole number, so decimal is also considered abnormal. So those are three types of tests. So they're asking you explain why abnormal test data is used. Also here in whenever we're wanting to test, that's because of multiple reasons. So explain and you have three points, so at least give three points and explain it in detail. To test the, de uh, the data that is outside of the range, and it should be not acceptable. So we do not allow the data that is uh, less than two, and more than 31. And to test that, that the correct data is entered, so the second reason, the data that the error message works. So to show that the error message is working, it should display the error message with the abnormal, whatever is wrong means abnormal and the error message will appear. Fourth reason, that is that the errors are trapped correctly. A type of, of collecting the errors, it's called trapping the errors. Next question. A teacher provides revision lessons during the holidays. The teacher plans to use web conferencing for the lessons. So the question is explain what is meant by web conference and how many points are here? Three points. Okay, we need to explain it in a form of paragraph. So you can choose any of the three points and then explain further about it. Okay. So web conference is a form of real or live or online communication that allow participants from different locations to participate at the same time. Okay, And you can carry on writing. And it is a multiple, it allow multiple users and devices to connect using the internet. So multiple users from different parts of the world, they can share one platform and they can join and discuss and share the lessons. And all the users will be able to see the same screen, especially from the person who's hosting uh, that web conference. So they will be able to share their screens. Whoever is sharing, everyone will be able to see that screen and share their experiences. And one more reason also you can see, uh, and communicating using the video cameras and microphones, so whatever devices and those type of little gadgets that you're having it or devices, it's going to facilitate and improve your web conference. Uh, experience. B. Evaluate the use of web conference in this scenario. So the question here is evaluate the use of web conference in this scenario. First question was explain what is meant. So they needed the meaning of web conference by explaining it. If the question is just define the meaning, that's going to be one or two points precise definition. That's it. That was explaining human some of the points and you explain them. Right now, evaluate. Evaluate has many points actually. Let me get back again to evaluate. So evaluate is to judge or calculate the quality. Okay. And you need to show also the importance and the amount of value of something. So here in this case, you will be able to use also advantages, disadvantages and explain them. All right. So. Evaluate the use of web conference, in this case, while the teacher is using it. So, you can mention as some positive points and some negative points. Always remember, evaluation comes into main two points, with their importance and calculations and judges. So, uh, how many questions? How many points? Six points. So, pay extra attention to the six-point question. Okay, so six point positive. So see that I'm making it in full sentences, not like a bulletin point. So positive points about the web conference that the students save time. They do not know to travel from one place to another. 
and it also eliminates the students to commute or using transportations and wasting a lot of money. So it saves the cost of traveling. It saves also the need to, like, no need to open on holidays and travel somewhere on holidays. So they can stay and learn from wherever they are. Students and teachers can work both from anywhere. You're on your holiday and you can spend some couple of hours and teach online or learn online. So, and another point is those lessons can be recorded and saved. So it is asynchronous as well. You can, uh, uh, you can uh, access it anytime later if you're not available at that time. The same for the teachers. You can record it and you can post it and you can access it anytime later. Then on the other hand, the negative points or evaluations is the hardware and software could be expensive. So you have to buy software, you have to buy some of the hardware parts and things. The more bigger the device is, of course, the more convenient and ergonomic it could be for you and it requires more money. It requires also reliable internet connection with unstable connection that could not be possible. So unless it is asynchronous, you have to download it and use it. Uh, you have to find some other solution if your connection is not reliable. And I think this could be issues with the child protection. So there could be some like uh, online platforms that do not have measurements for the kids or some privacy. So it could be a risk for the young students accessing those websites. And it could be also more difficult to concentrate if you're in front of your PC or laptop or phone as it has other apps, social media, friends, Discord and stuff and things that you can be using, it can be distracting you much easier. And like in the classroom, controlled by a teacher. If the hardware breaks or loose or there is a lack of hardware or no proper connection, students cannot then participate, then it could be like lacking some of students. It cannot also give them a full experience of participating in those classes. Online also only students with the correct specialist devices will be able to access and uh, take part in it. Otherwise, if your your speaker is not working, your mic is not working, then you won't have the full experience and you won't be able to participate properly. So this is evaluation. Remember, in evaluation, you have to mention both points. And as this is six points, at least mention three points from each. If you cannot remember three, three, then at least four or two from another side. Question number nine, uh, the product in a warehouse contain either a barcode. So we have a product in a warehouse. It contains a barcode or radio frequency identification, which is RFID, okay? So the data about each product is read electronically, okay? Compare, all right? That's like a very previous question. Uh, compare uh, the barcode readers and RFID readers, okay? Your answer must include, okay, they are mentioning that we need to mention similarities and differences, okay? How many points again for this? Six points. So three for comparison and three, uh, sorry, three for similarities and three for differences. We can use it. Or if you do not remember, you can use four, two, and so on. So for the similarities between RFID and barcode, you can see that both, they can read the products code. Both have the ab ability of scanning and reading, okay? Uh, RFID is usually an electronic device. They can read it as well as the barcode. Both readers use the direct data entry. That's because they can, uh, it's not the manual type. Both of them are uh, the second category. Let me remind you of the categories. If you look over here, you will find that in input category, we have three types of categories, subcategories, the manual, which is normal devices like keyboard, mouse, scanner, and usually in manual, as it is like a man, and then man have to be there to do most of the work. Keyboard cannot automatically type, mouse cannot automatically move, scanner cannot automatically function. So all those devices that need human interaction, it's called manual. Sensor, oh, sorry, I mean direct, which is what we're speaking right now about it, direct data input, which is, can just, you can just start it by him and by someone, and then it will operate by itself. For example, OCR, OCR, they can operate by themselves. Barcodes, they can read all the data process and give you the checkout, everything by itself. Uh, ANPR as well, that those are working usually on the streets by themselves without any human interaction. They are staying there to make it function. So those are called direct data entry. So you can mention, you can see over here, both of those devices are in the data entry part here. 
uh, same as well as the RFID. Um, okay, other points also the similarities. Both readers allow tracking of the products. Both you can use it for tracking the products uh, through whether the barcode or whatever it is. You can check it, how many products are inside this warehouse, how much like decreasing or how much we're getting more and so on. So it keeps track by using those two products. And both readers are contactless. It does not need to exactly touch the uh, product, no. It can be just from further or from a distance and it can track it from a bit far away. You no need to be physically touching that product. So speaking about the differences, on the other hand, the differences could be like barcode, readers only scan one barcode at a time. So it does like only one barcode can scan, be scanned at a time, while RFID can read multiple tags at that same time. So it's like more saving time, it can read easily. And I think the barcode, it reads only the, like requires a sight of uh, like a line of sight. In order to read a product barcode, the device needs to be in front of it, even though there is a distance, but it shouldn't be interrupted by any hand or wall or somebody standing. It needs to be in front of it in order to read it. While RFID does not really use it because it's using near field technology, so that's no need for the line of sight. And next point, again related to the same point, barcode readers need to be close to the barcode in order to read it. There is supposed to be a line of sight and a distance. It needs to be really close to it. RFID doesn't need to be really very close to it. So it needs, at least there should be a chip or a tag and it shouldn't be that much damage in order to be able to read it from a further distance. Barcode also needs to be correct position. If it is from an angle or somewhere like tilted, it's not going to be able to read it. You can see in the cashier supermarkets that sometimes there is a difficulty to read it. They have to make it properly again and again. While RFID, it's really more flexible and in terms of positioning. So it's easy to read it from any direct or any position. Barcode readers also might not be able to read or damage scratch barcodes. So it needs to be like clear barcode in order to read it. And RFIDs usually, um, for RFIDs can read even though it's a bit damaged or scratched, still readable. Another point is also, barcodes usually emit a light, that red light, whereas in RFID there is an electromagnetic or radio waves which is, do not have any color and it usually can travel really further distances. So those are like a lot of comparisons. You can choose any of the six points and write them down in the paragraph. Way and connected sentences. Next question is two points. Identify two other uses of RFID. We can use it actually in multiple places, in timing and tracking race, in attending uh, uh, for let's say calculating the attendance or tracking the attendance for an event or any place, livestock tracking like cows and sheep and stuff, library booking tracking as well for in uh, like in and out. Contactless for the card payment, like a POS, and the passports as well. They have um, ID, those type of RFIDs, especially the US and those countries. For the next question, meta tags uh, can be used in a web page, right? Meta tags can be used in a web page. Meta tag can be used to define the view port settings. Identify three other items that can be defined in meta tags. All right, let me show you first of all those points. So viewport, viewport is usually used inside HTML's header section and it is used inside the meta tags and it is for the purpose of controlling the scale and the control of the dimension of the page. For example, if you looked here, so you can see this example, this example is very clear in case we didn't write down the tag over here which is meta name viewport and the content. You won't be able to see that the image or the website is showing greatly in on the phone, on the tablet, and on the desktop. It will be like distorted and not clearly showing. Probably it might show properly on the desktop, but on other devices it might not show. But if you put this tag and you try to open it on different devices, you will be able to see that it is very it's responsive and the that it is showing very properly on each of the devices and adjusting. For example, on the phone it can show properly, on the desktop it can show in a better way, on the tablet it can show in a different, according to the size of the screen. So this is called viewport 
and you can organize it and uh, change or control the scales and dimensions of each uh, screen. The question here is, a meta tag can be used to define the viewport settings. Identify three other items can be defined in meta tags. So in meta tags, usually, I put an example over here. We usually use it in the head section. So this is my head section, starts here and ends somewhere down here. Uh, what I have, ignore the rest here, just focus over here. So I have in the head section the title as usual. Then I have some metadata over here. This metadata, I'm using it for the car set to show the encryption of different websites. And also I can use the name, I can use it for the content. So it's like a keyword, so I can use it also for uh, finding or tagging the website. So I can use it for the name attributes, for the character set also, and for the content attribute. So those are different examples beside the viewport. Okay, B, meta tags are used in the HTML of web pages. State the section of the HTML which contains the meta text. As I mentioned, it is inside the head section or element. Question number 11. Some gaming systems use gesture-based user interface, okay, which is using some, uh, uh, by using the hand to operate a game, okay. So describe what is meant, the question is describe what is meant by a gesture-based user interface question here is for two points you need to describe it and make sure that you're writing it in a in its location in a paragraph way not in bulletin points so what you can mention that you have gesture model right before that we have how many interfaces we have the command line interface then we got developed to the GUI graphic user interface and then we have gesture base uh, as I was mentioning, the CLI, GUI, and then you have the dialogue and the gesture base. The dialogue one is like Alexa and those type of devices that you can speak with the voice, interact with the, through the voice. Gesture is you have to interact it with the uh, signs or specific like hand gestures. So in this one, do you have to describe what is meant by the gesture? So in describing, you have to mention some of the points and completely describe it properly with some of the important points. So gesture base is using uh, gesture user interface is where the human body interacts with the device, especially like your hand you can mention, and interaction through some physical movements made by your body. And gesture, uh, gestures are supposed to detect those interruptions by using some sensors and camera and then convert it into a digital signals which will interrupt what it needs. A human, uh, where a human gives a command, usually they use some keyboard, mouse or pointing devices, but in here we're not using any of those commands or like keyboards or mouse or any pointing devices. We're using basically some of the hand waving, some pointing or some specific signatures or gestures to, uh, to point out what is uh, what we're trying. For example, screenshot, we can use like specific gesture or you can mention it or you can even go to the setting and you can set it by yourself, those gestures. So there are basically two points and you can mention those two points. Uh, the second part, which is describe the drawbacks of using gesture user, uh, user interface. And actually, we have a lot of drawbacks from gesture user interface. At the same time, we have some good points, but also some drawbacks. So here, the question is like four points, and it is described. So there are many drawbacks. You can say the fatigue, or it is known as gorilla arm syndrome. Let me show you this, actually. Usually, gorilla arm syndrome, it can happen because of excessive use of the arm, like pointing too much or typing too much or using it for whatever. It includes a lot of usage of your arms and hands. So it can happen like some type of strain can happen in your hand and it can lead to the uh, fatigue or gorilla arm syndrome. Another thing also, the drawbacks is unintentionally, you can activate some of the commands without purpose, without like intention that you're trying to point something, but it's understanding it in a different way. So it can happen to misunderstanding those commands and something else can be happening. So it's quite irritating sometimes. Another point, not as accurate as some other interfaces, especially the GUI could be accurate. CLI could be also quite accurate. So this one cannot be, it could be inaccurate because of those misinterruptions that can happen. It use uh, it has issues with stopping the gesture if the user touch a button or something. So unintentionally, if you touch something, something else, it could stop it, 
without uh, the main purpose. It has to have what uh, it have to learn. Okay, you have to learn all those gestures. You have to memorize them, remember them, because you cannot again and again keep looking what this specific gestures means. So you have to memorize them in order you will be able to use the device or that specific game with a hand gesture or gesture base. And it could cause some damage if it is in a restricted area. Imagine you're just sitting in a specific place, restricted area, you have to use your hands and feet as well or legs. At that time, it's very tiny area. It can cause you some of the issues or maybe physically can harm you. It may have some limited gestures, maybe up to 100 or 10 or 15. It might not allow more than that, those more than these gestures. And user with the physical disabilities will not be able to function those uh, gestures. So it is limited to uh, some specific people. And they have to learn accurately those gestures. As I mentioned, they have limited and you have to learn them earlier. And you have to accurately learn them how to do them. Okay, those were the points about the hand gestures drawbacks. Next question is 12. Movies can be stored on a Blu-ray discs on an internal hard disk. So you have Blu-ray and you have internal hard disk. Okay, so you have an optical device and you have a hard disk, which is a magnet. Describe, the question is describe. The Blu-ray discs are preferred. Okay, so, and you notice the question, it's a type of comparison by using describe. So why Blu-rays you have to say why Blu-rays are preferred to more than hard disk for storing movies, okay? So the question is four points. And you have to mention at least four points by describing them why Blu-rays are better than hard disk. So you can say that Blu-rays, and by the way, Blu-rays, they cannot be erased. And they usually high really have a, a high storage uh, area. And they're usually portable, you can easily carry them. Unlike the hard disk, which is fixed inside the computer, you cannot carry it portable. It's not portable or easy to carry. So it cannot be erased or edited. As it is written once, you cannot anymore erase it. So this feature allow whenever you know, you're know lending your CD or uh, Blu-ray to someone, it can just be stored and nobody will be able to delete it. Another thing also, the integrity. In terms of integrity, it is better in case the company want to print out so it is not allowing for the copying or burning of that Blu-ray. And uh, Blu-rays are usually portable, so it can be easily transported. Unlike the hardest, they don't, they cannot be easily, you know, uh, coming out of the device and you have to unscrew them and put and use them. As it is uh, one of the external devices, it does not take that inter that like, you know, huge st uh, storage place. And another thing, to have a large number of Blu-ray discs, therefore more storage, because you have a lot of them. You can use actually store a couple of them, and it won't take a lot of space, but it will have a lot of storage area with you. Hard disk is usually fixed on a computer, that's why it's not portable, and you won't be able to carry it with you easily. Another thing, the, it will usually take a lot of space, I mean physical space in your pocket, so it's a bit bigger in size comparing to the Blu-ray. I mention any of those four points on this. Part B, hard disk and Blu-ray. This are example of backing storage. So state two characteristics of backing storage. Backing storage is whenever you're wanting, you do not want to use those data daily. You want just to store it and use it for backing up or saving it. So you can see those characteristics can be they are non-volatile, means they are permanent. They cannot be deleted by themselves. So there will be stored inside those devices forever. Stores the data permanently, which is explaining the first point. And you can also mention, in other words, that it is slower to access than internal memory. Uh, internal memories here, we mean RAM, ROM, and CPU. They're usually, their access rate is very fast. And like those external devices, Blu-rays are considered usually uh, slow. Hard is uh, also slow. And like SSD, if you compare to SSD, they're a bit faster, but still, Comparing to the internal memory, they are much way faster. Next part of this question B, identify two other types of backing storage. Actually, we have a couple of backing storage. The most famous is the magnetic tape. 
because they are the slowest in access rate. So they can be stored for a very long time and also they can store huge data. CD, DVD, DVD, RAM, memory cards or those small flash cards, pen drives or USBs, SSDs, cloud storage and flash memory. All those are considered different types of backing storage. Only mention two of them and write them down. Question number 13. Weather forecasters use computer modeling. Explain why computer modeling is used to forecast the weather. Okay, in chapter 6 uh, in ICT applications, we have a couple of uses for different apps and one of those applications is computer modeling. We can use computer modeling, let me open that. We can use computer modeling in weather forecasting, in traffic forecasting, like in different situations. And then, let me open it first. Over here in modeling, actually we can use modeling in weather forecasting in different purposes for the weather forecasting. The wind direction, biometric or the air pressure and the humidity. There are a lot of this type of sensors that can be even sold for different individuals. You can even use it at your home to detect or model the weather forecasting devices. So weather forecasting is quite usually used very worldwide by different people or different organizations and they can be used for the purpose of checking the weather and learning from the weather. The question here explain why we're using this computer modeling for forecasting the weather and weather is explained four points so large number of variables makes it more difficult for a human to forecast it correctly or accurately which is humidity, pressure, wind speed and so on that I mentioned it previously. So computers can handle this very greatly. They have this type of, they can learn from those variables, store them and they can detect it or simulate it for the upcoming days and months and weeks and years. And they can predict for the long term even, for the long range weather like global warming, what is going to happen in the couple of years coming. Not too precisely, but they can accurate, they can say to some extent, you might notice it's sometimes not accurate, but still it's trying to improve and learn from the previous weather forecastings. Another point, it's also faster, a uh, faster way of producing weather patterns than using a human. Of course, human won't be able to predict that much greatly. So computers, they can really use it. And by the way, you should know that always with the weather forecasting, we're using supercomputers. As they're really because most of those uh, uh, most of those uh, operations are really complex, and we have to use supercomputers in order to forecast and use it. Especially weather forecasting, we're using supercomputers. And I think it's faster way of producing the patterns over time. Like in this specific city, in May or in summer or in winter, how's the weather? So they have a specific pattern, and they use that pattern over time. They can also deal with the more complex calculations in a quicker, faster way and there are more accurate results produced over time especially. You will find better accurate results will be keep coming out and can give residents early warning in case there is an earthquake or there is a flooding going to happen or any severe catastrophe going to happen. So it's going to give uh, a warning or it is really useful in this type of issues. B. Data is collected by different types of sensor and then input, it, input to the computer model to be processed. Okay. So, identify two sensors that could be used to collect the weather data. So, we have pressure sensor, temperature sensor, wind speed, humidity or moisture sensor. To process the data, then it's the output. Right now about the output. Identify two output devices. So, we have monitor, printer, plotter, which is a very big uh, printers, we can use any of those devices or mention at least two of those devices. The last question. E-publishing software is used to create an e-publishing to display school's yearly magazine. Describe the characteristics of an e-publication. Uh, that's from chapter, the communication part from I think chapter, uh, anyway beginning chapters probably from that contain communication parts so uh, we can mention that uh, for the e-publication question is described four points so uh, some of the characteristics you can mention that it allows for the e-publication it allows multimedia to be embedded into those pages like videos audio clips uh, 
pictures, interactive features that you can interact, you can connect it to the social media, some of them. Let's say you can go to their social media page or you can even put the likes and stuff and things to it. It allows also for the auto changes of the pages, like after a few seconds, it can just change dynamically. It also, uh, it, it is digital, so it can be used in other documents as well. So you can open it with the different ways as well. And uh, sections can be linked internally and externally. Uh, it has hyperlink, so you can connect it to other links. You can also uh, let it come to that link or part to be read part of it. You can make it part of the website as well. So you can share those links or you can include it into uh, a link. You can as put it as well as inside that e-publication. Readers can interact the e -publication, uh, with those e-publications by making, let's say, links or multimedia or quizzes or forums. Um, they can use by many users simultaneously, so different parts of the world, different users can be using it at the same time, thus they can be interacting with it, like I mentioned previously, and it is always up to date. It's not like static, not changing, not dynamic, and it's always changing, updated, so whatever the recent news coming to it, it will be always showing to you those recent news. The e-publishing software is subject to software copyright legislation. So give two methods that could be used to prevent copy software copyright legislation being broken. So I want you to give me two of those methods for those copyright issues that can have be broken. And I need just two points. For example, I can give you users type in a unique license serial number. This is one. By purchasing it, you will get the uh, license fee. User installed. The DRM, uh, the DRM, which is part of the code that can stop you from copying it. And you can use also the license agreement as well. You can also run the software with a CD or a dongle. So only if you have that specific part attached to your computer, it will you will be able to use that software. And you have to get the permission from the owner. They can give you the permission by...